Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Witness testimony begins in the Alex Jones defamation trial out of Connecticut. Is what you saw in that school fake? No, no, sir. <coughs> no, sir. Was it synthetic? No, sir. No, sir. See any actors that day, Bill? No, sir. No. And the Pike County Massacre. Why some witness testimony will not be broadcast. Plus, a verdict may soon be handed down in the federal sex crimes trial of singer R. Kelly. And later, a bombshell from the Parkland School Shooters defense team. At this time, the defense rests. <laughs> We're not playing chess. I mean... Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. Testimony kicks off with an emotional witness in the Alex Jones defamation trial out of Connecticut. Last month, the Texas jury ordered Jones to pay $49.3 million in damages to the parents of Jesse Lewis, a student who was shot and killed in the 2012 massacre. Jones now faces trial in Connecticut, where 15 plaintiffs filed a total of three lawsuits against him after he claimed that the school shooting was a hoax put on by crisis actors. The plaintiffs made up of family members of the students killed and an FBI agent say Jones's followers have harassed them and even made death threats. Jones has already been found liable for damages in the case, meaning jurors will now decide how much Jones should pay. An ex-FBI agent, William Aldenburg, was the first witness called in the case. He broke down several times throughout his testimony, recalling the day of the shooting in 2014 and the harassment from Jones's followers. It's one of the worst things that ever happened, if not the worst thing that ever happened here, right? What happened to them? And, it, and people want to say this didn't, didn't happen? And, and then they want to get rich off of it? You know, that's the worst part. Like, you know what? You can say whatever you want about me. I don't care. I'm, you just say whatever you want. I'm friggin' a big boy. I can take it. Then they, they, want, to, they want to make profits. They want to make millions and millions of dollars. They want to destroy people's lives. Their, their children got slaughtered. I saw it myself. And now they have to listen, sit here and listen to me say this. And... and these people made millions upon millions upon millions. They destroyed everybody. They don't give a damn. That's why. That's what's upsetting about it. Testimony continued on Wednesday as an attorney for Jones's company, Free Speech Systems, took the stand. Attorneys grilled her on Jones's claim of telling the truth to a loyal following. Free Speech Systems agrees that Alex Jones has built a very loyal following, correct? Sure. Okay. A very engaged following. Yes? Yes. His credibility with his audience is central to his ability to sell them products, correct? I think he said that too, so yes. And that's why he tells them that when they come to InfoWars, he'll give them the truth and nothing but, right? I think that's one of his taglines, so yes. And he tells, he calls his audience truth seekers, correct? Yes. And even though Alex Jones is not a journalist, he tells his audience that he will deliver them the truth in journalism, correct? I think that's also a tagline, yes. Joining us today is legal analyst Florina Altschiller and co-host Terry Austin. Florina, ex-FBI agent Aldenberg's testimony there, as you saw, where he broke down on the stand, seems to resonate with law and crime viewers. Do you think it's doing the same with the jury? Uh, you know, we can't see the jury's reaction, but I can't imagine how this sincere, emotional, and impactful testimony is not resonating with the jury. This is a man who walked into an elementary school, first on scene, to discover 20 dead children. Not actors and actresses, 20 dead children children, of course he's going to have an emotional reaction. And of course he's going to relive that moment now emotionally on the witness stand. And I expect that, that it's going to have a very powerful effect on the jury that's going to re re result in a significant monetary damage award. I think the same as well. Terry, the judge does not seem to be very impressed with the defense. Could Jones's attorney be doing more harm than good? 
Absolutely. You know, his attorney managed to antagonize Judge Bellis, which doesn't bode well for Alex Jones. Norman Pattis is his attorney, and he's normally quite flamboyant. He's ostentatious. He has represented some very major clients, Fotis Dulos, before he passed away. But his arguments have not been based on the law. During his opening statement, he was rambling. It didn't really make sense. And it also hasn't been based on facts. And in fact, the judge made him stop talking about certain things that aren't going to come into the case. For instance, he repeatedly made references to Hillary Clinton and the 2016 election. So he's kind of going off base here, and it's not helping his client. Yeah, and the judge even commented on that. Doesn't want to hear no more about Hillary Clinton in the courts. It's uh, maybe not the best tactic to pull in court, but we'll see how it continues. And in California, the trial of Paul and Ruben Flores is off for the rest of the week after just one day of testimony as the father and son face charges in the 1996 disappearance and death of Kristen Smart. The Cal Poly student went missing after a party in May of 1996, but the case went cold for two decades with very few leads. Paul and Ruben Flores were long suspected in the case and were arrested just last year. Witnesses say Paul was the last person seen with Smart. He is charged with her murder. Ruben is charged with accessory after the fact for allegedly helping to hide the body, accused of bur burying her in his backyard and later moving her. Smart's body has never been found. The only day of testimony this week included a woman who said Paul told her he had buried Smart under the ramp at his home the summer after she went missing. She said she was a teenager at the time and was scared to tell anyone about the conversation. Jennifer Hudson broke down in tears several times while on the stand telling jurors she felt partially responsible for the Smart family suffering all these years. Testimony is set to resume next Monday. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a verdict may soon be handed down to disgrace R&B singer R. Kelly. But first, the Pike County Massacre. What witnesses the prosecution calls to testify as George Wagner IV is tried for murder. Welcome back. The jury hears from several law enforcement officers who opted not to be broadcast on TV in the Pike County Massacre trial of defendant George Wagner IV. Wagner, his brother Jacob, and their parents are charged with murdering eight members of the Rodin and Gilly families in April of 2016. Prosecutors say the shooting deaths came amid a custody dispute involving a young child Jacob Wagner shared with Hannah Rodin. The victims were found shot to death in their homes in four different locations. Most were shot as they slept. Jake has already pled guilty to the murders and will spend the rest of his life in prison and has agreed to testify against his family members. George Wagner IV says he's not guilty because he didn't actually pull the trigger in the crimes. The case is considered one of Ohio's largest criminal investigations. Wednesday, several witnesses opted not to be on camera, including Pike County Sheriff Tracy Evans, who is an elected official. Another Pike County deputy testified on camera about one of the crime scenes and finding several of the victims dead with their baby still alive beside them. Terry, how much of the case rests on Jake and Angela's testimony, and do you think the jury will find accomplices of such a murder credible? You know, anytime you have an accomplice and they're testifying, that jury is going to pay very close attention. They want to figure out whether or not the person testifying is telling the truth or whether they're going to point the finger to someone else. And in this case, you have two family members, so the jury's going to pay even closer attention. One of the things that Jake is going to testify is the fact that everyone was involved, and he has already admitted to carrying out five of the murders. But in exchange, as you said, for his testimony, he's not going to get the death penalty, and the others are not going to get the death penalty. And they're going to listen to Angela as well. You know, it must be hard for a mother to be testifying against a son and against, a, you know, her husband. Frankly, I think the jury is definitely going to want to see what she has to say, and they're going to think she's telling the truth, because why would anyone say anything negative against your family member? Absolutely. Florina, I get it. The average person, the, the, the doctor, the teacher, the, the small business owner, they may want to opt out of being able to be shown on camera, but do you think police officers should have that ability as well? Absolutely not. You know, I absolutely understand and respect that people who are witnesses or victims of a crime may want their privacy and may not want this horrible tragedy 
to be televised for the world to see as entertainment. However, when it comes to police officers, their job is to investigate crime and testify at trial. That is their job. I don't think they should have the privilege of choosing whether or not their testimony gets televised because it's completely part of what they're being paid to do. And so to opt out of it is just like a firefighter saying, I'll run into a burning building. Oh, but not if it's a four alarm fire, not gonna run into that one. They shouldn't have that choice. Yeah, I also don't see the harms that they would face like a, like a regular citizen, but that's what's happening in that case. Well, switching to Tennessee, the man accused of going on a shooting rampage through Memphis last week appears before a judge as a gag order is put in place in the case of Ezekiel Kelly. Kelly allegedly shot six people last Wednesday, three of them fatally. Police initially thought there was a fourth victim, but later determined that one was not connected. Officials say Kelly live streamed one of the shootings on social media, after which a manhunt began. Police believe all but one of the shootings were random. After his arrest, the 19-year-old was arraigned on one charge of first-degree murder and is being held without bond. He appeared on Tuesday morning before the judge for only a brief five minutes, during which the judge ordered the case not be discussed publicly and told Kelly to return to court on Friday. The 19-year-old has been out of jail less than five months at the time of the shooting after 11 months in jail for a 2020 aggravated assault. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the defense makes a startling announcement in the Parkland school shooter penalty phase trial. Plus, the jury moves into deliberations as R. Kelly stands trial on federal sex crimes. Welcome back. An Illinois jury hands down a verdict as disgraced R&B singer R. Kelly stands trial on federal sex crimes. Allegations of Kelly's misconduct dates back to the early 1990s. Kelly and his co-defendant and former business manager Daryl McDavid are charged with fixing Kelly's child pornography trial in 2008, in which Kelly was acquitted. He allegedly threatened witnesses and concealed video evidence, including an alleged sex tape with a then 14-year-old girl, who did not testify in 2008, but took the stand in this trial admitting she was the one in the video. She told the jury R. Kelly sexually abused her over a hundred times. Closing arguments were presented all day Monday and into Tuesday as prosecutors called for justice for the women abused by Kelly. For his team's defense, attorneys slammed government witnesses saying they were liars who only testified under immunity. During closings, uh, jurors suffered a panic, a panic attack saying she couldn't handle one minute more. She was later dismissed. On Wednesday, jurors brought forward three questions asking for records and clarification on the wording of Kelly's charges. In June, Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in prison for separate federal sex crimes convictions. Terry, a few questions asked by the jury. What issue do you think would have taken them the longest to decide? Well, it's interesting. It didn't take them long at all. We don't know what the verdict is. But I think one of the issues they may have been having trouble with was whether or not there was obstruction as far as Kelly's concern on that 2008 trial. That was a long time ago. The evidence might not have been as fresh as some of the new evidence. But I do think if they found him guilty on one count, he will probably be found guilty on most of the other counts. As far as the co-defendant McDavid is concerned, he's the former manager. I think he may not have gotten a conviction on all counts, but we will see all in all, there were 13 counts, everything ranging from child pornography to obstruction of justice, to receiving child pornography and enticing minors for sex. So we'll see how the judge and the jury come out on this, but I think they took it very seriously and looked at all of that evidence. Florina, I know it's innocent until proven guilty, but I think the assumption is he might be found guilty. How does this work out with his last conviction in New York, and how's that jail time going to play out? The judge is going to be bound by the sentencing guidelines, but I think it's fair to say he's 55 years old. He's already serving a sentence of 30 years. This other sentence, if convicted, is going to run consecutively not concurrent because this is a completely separate case, separate trial, there's separate instances, so there's no way to stack it. So he's not going to get out until really he's dead. I, I'm expecting that 
the sentencing guidelines are going to look at the prior conviction as an aggravating factor, and he's going to be handed down a sentence of several decades. All right, we'll see how that verdict comes in. Also in celebrity news, a New York photographer is suing pop singer Miley Cyrus after she posted a photo he took of her on her social media. The photographer claims that Cyrus posted the image without his permission, which he says violates his copyright holding. The filing is among 20 copyright lawsuits by Robert Barbera. He has brought against celebrities and business, businesses over the last three years, including Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, and Dua Lipa. According to the lawsuit, Barbera had taken the photo of Cyrus waving as she exited a building in February of 2020. She posted the photo online that same day, Barbera registered the image with the U.S. Copyright Office in April, but didn't realize Cyrus had posted it to Instagram until a month later. He claims the photo increased traffic to the singer's account and gave her an increase in revenues. Many of his cases have been settled within a couple months of being filed. There's no word on how much money Barbera is seeking. When we come back, we look to Florida for the Parkland school shooter penalty phase trial. That's where a shocking move by the defense leaves the, the case's judge in shock and awe. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. An elected Nevada official makes his first court appearance after his arrest for the murder of a prominent Las Vegas journalist. 44-year-old Robert Tells made his first court appearance on Tuesday, just weeks after renowned investigative journalist Jeff German was found stabbed to death outside of his home. German had previously reported on Tells' workplace misconduct for the Las Vegas Review Journal. Tells was charged with premeditated murder. As prosecutors allege, he was lying in wait for the reporter before he killed him. He's due back in court on September 20th to be arraigned. Headed east to Florida, where the Parkland School shooter penalty phase trial takes a shocking turn when the defense rests its case and the presiding judge calls the move uncalled for and unprofessional. In the weeks-long trial, a Broward County jury will decide whether the Parkland school shooter will receive life in prison or the death penalty. Last year, he pled guilty to all charges, stemming from the 2018 school shooting where 17 people were killed and 17 more injured. While the trial began in mid-July, the defense began its case only three weeks ago calling witnesses that spoke of the defendant's difficult upbringing. Court resumed Wednesday morning, where the defense was expected to continue its case that included 800 potential witnesses. After refusing to tell the judge who was the next witness and attorney questioning them, the defense abruptly rested its case. Your Honor? Yes, um, at this time the defense rests, other than putting in our records. We're not playing chess. I mean, will you please take the jury back in? Thank you. All right, go ahead and bring your records. To B. Nicholas Cruz Henderson, episode one record. Let me just stop. State, are you going to have anything ready for today? No. <laughs> We're, 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 us there was 80 witnesses. we're waiting for 40 more witnesses. I just want to say, this is the most uncalled for, unprofessional way to try a case. You, you all knew about this, and even if you didn't make your decision till this morning, to have 22 people plus all of this staff and every attorney march into court, be waiting as if it's some kind of game, now I have to send them home. The state's not ready. They're not going to have a witness ready. We have another day wasted. I, I just, I honestly, I have never experienced a level of unprofessionalism in my career. It, it's unbelievable. The prosecution indicated it was not prepared for a rebuttal case on Wednesday. Judge Freer then dismissed the jury until September 27th. Florida, the defense has rested its case in what seems like an unprofessional way, according to the judge. But where do you see the strengths in their case? Unfortunately, since the defendant pled guilty, and there's no question that he did this, and this is the most horrific crime I could possibly think of, killing innocent school children. The question before this jury is whether or not to execute him. 
What the defense did well is they put on evidence of fetal alcohol syndrome and of how Nicholas Cruz was essentially assaulted starting as a fetus in a womb and how his brain resultantly was not able to develop properly. The problem is he killed a lot of innocent school children. And I think that even if true, even if he had fetal alcohol syndrome, that is an excuse that's not going to excuse away the death penalty for a crime that is the most horrific crime that a person can possibly commit. And there's no question here that he's the one that committed it. He's already pled guilty Absolutely. to all of the counts. Absolutely. Terry, so where does the prosecution go with their rebuttal? You know, they only have two weeks, which actually is an unusually amount of time for this type of, you know, case for a rebuttal where we're only focusing on the life or the death issue. But I do think they're going to look at those aggravating factors, particularly that it was heinous and that it was premeditated. Absolutely. We'll see how it plays out. Well, thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.